Oh, you're loading up on reading material. John, sit. I'll sit together here. Okay. All right, thank you, everyone. If you're standing, please take a seat and we'll start our next panel. Uh, I'm glad to tell you there will be an actual break after this session, and although we're starting a tad late, we'll uh, still try to stay on our ending uh, time. Uh, I'm Eric Cohen, uh, one of the co-founders of Act for Sedan, and I'm delighted to be able to moderate uh, this panel in particular with uh, two people who uh, all of you who are here know very well for their long work on Sudan. Uh, just to highlight a couple of things about the two speakers, John Prendergast uh, has worked in Africa policy for uh, 25 years and is the co-founder of the Enough Project. And uh, uh, many, as, uh, many of us went to school reading, to school on Sudan reading papers that John wrote, uh, either at Enough or at the International Crisis Group. He's been in and out of presidential administrations and State Department and uh, now gets to speak more publicly because he's not in government. So welcome, John. Thanks. And uh, our other speaker is uh, Rich Williamson, who has a very long and distinguished uh, career inside several administrations. And I'm not going to, you can read his bio to read all the different titles he holds. But one mm -hmm. of the most important ones to us and to this conference is that he was uh, George Bush's uh, last special envoy to Sudan. And the more you know about what he did and tried to do as that special envoy, the more uh, respect and appreciation you have for him. So Rich, welcome. Thank you. So for our uh, panel today, we're going to start with uh, some brief me remarks by John and, uh, or excuse me, by Rich and then by John. And uh, unlike other panels, there. They're really not going to say too much at the beginning. That's, at least that's what they told me. <laughs> Whoops. But they wanted to have conversation. So we want to have a lot of questions, and we have a fair amount of time from the agenda to do that. So uh, after their uh, brief remarks, I'm going to ask uh, a series of questions mainly focused on looking back. And then, uh, and then just before I open it up to everybody, I'll ask one question about looking forward. And then I hope there can be many questions mainly focused on looking forward as a way to maybe make this as productive uh, as possible about what we could do. When we do get to that question and answer period, uh, we're playing by the same rules. Uh, so come to the aisles if you have uh, questions and, and line up. And, uh, and, and uh, it'll be my job to keep you to a minute and you either ask a question or we say thank you. So uh, that's how that'll go. So uh, with that, uh, Rich. Thanks. First, I want to thank uh, Eric Cohen, Joe, the other organizers, and for you who are interested in this important topic for being here. Second, I want to note my friend Luis Marino Campo, who is a distinguished attorney and lifelong crusader for justice, but as you all know, a historic figure for his work both in Argentina and at the ICC, and uh, with whom I developed a very Unlikely, but close friendship. Thank you, Louise. And John Prendergast, who uh, taught me a lot and was uh, helpful uh, when I was special envoy, even as he pushed us to do more. Uh, then let me just do a coda to get it behind me. I have enormous respect for the uh, intentions and efforts of some of my friends in the Obama administration, Susan Rice, Samantha Powers, David Pressman, Gail Smith. I say that because I'm going to be less generous in some of my other comments more generally. But I will note, it's fascinating to me that a number of those people who uh, certainly didn't uh, uh, feel restraint uh, for eight years in criticizing um, the Bush administration now plead about, oh, but it's so hard to get things done. Mm -hmm. They didn't give us that. Uh, and, and frankly, you shouldn't either. Um, it is really hard to get things done. But feet need to be held to the fire. Look at this. Sudanese people um, have suffered way too much. They've had to digest, to absorb. But there is a fatigue 
There's a fatigue in Washington and elsewhere. On Sudan, on the DRC, uh, and there's a reluctance to deal with the ghastly incidents in Syria. That would happen no matter what. But the climate's worse because the last administration overreached, and the American people understandably were concerned about that overreach, and now we've overcorrected where the administration wants to disengage and retrench, which is another way to say we want to do as little as possible unless we feel politically compelled to act. Ten years later, you still have two million IDPs, refugees from Darfur. The violence continues. I like um, Nick Kristof's phase of a genocide in slow motion. It's still ghastly and it still goes on. In the north-south, you have the Nuba Mountains and the Blue Nile. And Omar al-Bashir's got an arrest warrant for genocide from the ICC. Yet, almost four years later, he's comfortably in power. He travels. And the principle of accountability has been compromised in part because of the failure of the United States government. We have an economic crisis in Sudan at one plus year after the oil was interrupted. You've got a humanitarian crisis, you've got a governance crisis, you've got a security crisis, all of which is stressing both Khartoum and Juba, which give you an opportunity to drive change. Perhaps one can make an argument leading up to the referendum on the CPA that neutrality was an intelligent position. I'm not sure how much it was a conscious decision as a consequence of the Special Envoy's activities uh, which limited the administration's maneuvering room. But we've had the implementation through the referendum and the separation. The two toughest issues were kicked down, which we knew about in 07, 08, 09, the referendum, and that was the oil revenue sharing and contested border areas. The administration decided to allow those to be kicked down the road instead of using the opportunity of maximum leverage approaching the referendum to get both Juba and Khartoum more reasonable to strike an agreement. But the crisis continues, and it's wrong to downgrade the diplomatic status. Let's talk a little bit about a special envoy. I have enormous respect for Princeton Lyman. When I was assistant secretary in the 80s, and he was ambassador to Nigeria, we worked together. He did a great job in South Africa as a midwife to help that transition. He was a good assistant secretary of state. But the skills one develops as a good career foreign service officer are not those you need in a situation like Sudan. You need a political personality outside that system to kick the tires, put the pressure on, and I also feel, and we'll be willing to discuss further later, it should be a presidential special envoy. The difference is I only answered to one guy. And if I made a call, he picked up the phone. We did or didn't do as much as we should have. It drove the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs crazy, and that's a good thing. It was frustrating to the seventh floor of the department, and that's a good thing. And it drove the national security advisor crazy, and that's a good thing. If this crisis, if we are sincerely committed to end the suffering that's gone on, you should be willing to have a way beyond the bureaucracy to the only person elected in the executive department to make a decision 
and to hold true to the commitment he made in 08 when I drafted a letter and got McCain, Clinton, and with the help of John and Susan, candidate Obama to sign, which I in turn used against uh, Bashir to say things wouldn't get easier after Bush was done. But President Obama, I think his sentiments are sincere. If you asked him, does he believe A, B, and C, he would give you the right answers. But the bottom line, having worked in three, around three presidents in the Oval Office, is it's just not that high a priority. And a special envoy reporting to the president disrupts the process and can make a difference. It's wrong to be diverted. It's wrong to find the status quo acceptable. And we saw in the lead up to the referendum on CPA implementation what happens when the President of the United States does get engaged and gets his Vice President engaged and gets the Secretary of State engaged personally. It was only a moment, only a couple of weeks, but it was critical for Bashir to recalibrate and for the neighbors to recalibrate and allow the referendum to go forward. Is it too much to expect that type of commitment, at least every once in a while, to move what is an ongoing humanitarian crisis? Humphrey, Hubert Humphrey, uh, one of my favorite politicians, once said, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. I would assert to you that the moral test of a foreign policy for the U.S. government is how the government helps the suffering, the voiceless victims, and gives hope to the hopeless. And in Sudan, we failed the test. Finally, President Obama said the following on March 28, 2011, in the context of Libya, quote, to brush aside America's responsibility as a leader, and more profoundly, our responsibility to our fellow human beings in Libya, would have been a betrayal of those of who we are, a betrayal of who we are. Some nations may be able to turn a blind eye to atrocities in other countries. The United States of America is different. And as president, I refuse to wait for the images of slaughter and mass graves before taking action. Well, the pictures are there. The body count has increased during his watch. The patient should be exhausted. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. I, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've just found our next special envoy. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. <laughs> the past is future. I said at the beginning well. of the Obama administration, why are we changing our <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you couldn't have been more right about anything, huh? Jeez. That was a rough period. Um, I just uh, returned about a month ago from uh, uh, yeah, another trip, and many of you in this in this room have made similar ones, uh, going across the border from South Sudan into into Sudan, uh, into the Nuba Mountains, seeing firsthand and listening to the testimonies of of people that we have now heard reproduced over and over again since well since the 80s in South Sudan, and uh, since 2003, or those that were listening more intently from the late 90s for Darfur, uh, same tactics, same regime, uh, aerial bombing, indiscriminate bombing, food, food is starvation as a weapon of war, ultimate objective, demographic change, population clearance, ethnic cleansing, all of the different terminologies that you might use, driving people who disagree with you out of the country, killing them or driving them out of the country. North-South so North -South talks are going nowhere. Uh, parties are playing a game of chicken and the, si the cartoon signs deal hadn't implemented anything since the referendum and Rich's point is so right, I hope everyone heard it. When the, when the administration was engaged and did focus for whatever week, number of weeks it was, as you say, 
got a lot done uh, on that referendum, but otherwise, nothing, nothing's been implemented. Lots of agreements, you know, that's one of the things that we've been really good at, uh, is getting people to sign pieces of paper. Uh, and with all these agreements, with all this diplomacy, even what probably some of the folks that are in government think of as pressure, uh, the core issue that I think brings us here would have brought us here a decade ago, and if we don't deal with it, will bring us again a decade from now. The core issue of bad governance is not being addressed in any of these agreements. Um, and Khartoum uses the negotiations, worse, uses the negotiations to divide uh, further their opposition. The status quo that exists now and that our policy helps facilitate, I think, uh, uh, reinforces uh, the risk to Sudan as the state we know it in two ways. Uh, first, uh, politically, uh, the potential for disintegration. Uh, over time, movements that have worked assiduously and demanded uh, reform at the center, demanded greater autonomy, all of the kind of things that usually rebel groups are fighting for, will potentially eventually turn outward and want uh, separation just as the South got. Um, I believe that those centrifugal forces are, are, are enormous and, the, uh, and, and growing. And the other risk to Sudan, as we know it, is economic, of course, the potential for implosion, which is shared with South Sudan, as I'm sure many people made point yesterday. So this is bad enough on its own, but of course we have this added layer of a history of, with the National Islamic Front, National Congress Party, and its relationships with all kinds of different unsavory characters, going back to Al-Qaeda and the rest of them, and particularly worrying the increasing, again, uh, uh, closeness of the relationship with Iran. There are factions, I believe, in the ruling party, and I think we see that very visibly, uh, who want to just simply slam the door on the West, which uh, for what, what is whatever, whatever change that would actually bring in terms of a worst case scenario, uh, we can use our imaginations and turn completely to Iran and China and others. I think there are real divisions and we're not exploiting them. So I do believe though there is a bright spot that um, it's faint, but, but it's perceptible. And uh, the hope, I believe, for Sudan's future lies in the opposition and civil society and their aspirations and their organizing and their courage uh, in attempting to bring about real change uh, in Sudan. And this is occurring on a number of levels, and, and some people here in this audience actually represent those levels, and you heard from some of them yesterday. The SRF, I think, is a very important uh, development. It's similar to what we saw in, when uh, Garang was still alive with the, with the National Democratic Alliance as we try, as, as the effort to pull together the various forces of, of opposition to the regime uh, and a recognition that uh, if we don't hang together, we'll all hang separately. And we're seeing the coalescence, I believe, uh, at least good signs in that direction of increasing uh, opposition coherence. You have the new Don Charter, which I think is really important, and this is exactly what the United States has asked Sudanese opposition to, uh, to uh, undertake, which is a, some kind of a, a specific agenda for the future. Uh, and they've done it, and now we haven't responded. So uh, the new Dawn Charter is something I think that uh, we need to increasingly recognize as, as, as something to build upon. The National Consensus Forces, you know, it's just there's more coherence. Again, it's self-interest, recognition, but that's a, that's a direction that needs to be supported. And finally, of course, the civil society protests that demonstrate the width and depth of opposition to this regime on a number of fronts, particularly economic. Um, we'll have a new administration in D.C. here. We have now. People are being put in place slowly but surely. Blinken, Tony Blinken replaces Dennis McDonough in that key slot as the Deputy National Security Advisor, the person who will have probably the greatest influence on the President's thinking on a daily basis. 
So that is interesting for a lot of reasons. And uh, the new Secretary of State will have his new Assistant Secretary in place soon, and there'll be a new envoy, at, and, and uh, all of the things that, that Rich said are, are terribly important to take into consideration. I, I, I fear the, the, the instinct is not what you say. You know, it's to get somebody who's in the system and can work the system and implement as opposed to imagine. And uh, uh, so we have to work on the policy. Because if the policy is right, then, the impl then whoever's implementing it uh, won't damage us so badly. Uh, and I think that, that now is the time for our policy to more clearly invest uh, in opposition and civil society and their support for a different future in Sudan. So what's the conceptual framework for a new policy? What are the objectives? What are we trying to achieve? With, that, with the next steps. I think there are four things. And, and the four things that I would offer equal one, which we don't need to articulate because of its, the counterproductiveness of it, but we'll get to that in a second. The four things I would argue are these. First, preparing for a democratic transition. Second, supporting economic viability. Third, preventing state disintegration. And fourth, supporting future leadership. What does that package represent? Regime change. You don't use that terminology for a million reasons. It's anathema here, and it's poison abroad. So our agenda, I think, ought to be these things, because these things are the agenda of the Sudanese people. Now, what are the tools to achieve these objectives? Yeah, the tools are limited. You can make all kinds of arguments that, this, that the toolbox is shrinking because of that overreach that Rich talked about uh, in his remarks. I'd like to highlight two specific tools that I think are most crucial going forward. In the universe of the possible, with the crowd we have now, in the world we want, what is it, the world versus the world you live, we live in, in the world we want, I would have a lot more tools that I'd be talking to you about. And I'm sure Mukesh is going to bring out a few of those <laughs> in the next one. But I want to talk about two things that I think are achievable and would make a difference and would reinforce and undergird what the Sudanese people are trying to do themselves. Tool one is in the realm of, the, of diplomatic strategy. It is a deeper political engagement to support these four objectives, the democratic transition, economic viability, the prevention of state disintegration, and supporting of future leadership. What does that mean? Well, it means increasing support, or actually supporting the new Don Charter as a beginning of a conversation about the future of, Sud of Sudan. Deepening engagement specifically with opposition elements, political armed and unarmed, as well as civil society. And also deepening engagement with NCP factions. We need to surprise, we need to confuse uh, the, the ruling party in Khartoum. We have been, become so predictable, the United States government, uh, over the last 20 years with our policy. Individuals have distinguished themselves by pushing that envelope of that policy as far as an envelope possibly can be pushed. And Richard, first and foremost, by far, of the, I guess, 10 envoys we've had in the last uh, X, X years, uh, has done so. But, uh, so I think the, uh, the idea that we need to increase our engagement with all these different elements within the NCP, just talking and, and understanding better what's happening within these groups. Now, how do you do that? Well, I think you just said it. We need to increase diplomatic representation. And I'm not just talking about in Khartoum. Khartoum would be the linchpin because we need to talk to everyone, but we also need representation that is focused on Sudan and the and opposition and other elements in Juba, in Jemena, in Doha, in Beijing, and, and, and decentralizing these big bureaucracies that we build up in Washington, D.C., the Sudan office or whatever they call it, and, and, and getting people into the field and, and, and engaging and pushing and pressing for, uh, 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 in support of, of these groups. The second tool I would talk about <coughs> is capacity building for civil society and, 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 and opposition, armed and unarmed. What does that mean? 
Well, I think they're very specific things. Supporting uh, radio and TV, uh, uh, satellite TV. Uh, supporting the ability to deliver services of the SRF in the field. Remember, for years, the SPLM had the SRA. The EPLF had ERA. The TPLF had REST. All of these different entities that worked for, for many, many years as uh, opposition, as, as liberation movements, uh, eventually became governments, became service deliverers. And they showed, they demonstrated some capacity over time for, and let's start helping to build the capacity of these elements to govern. Uh, support for pastoralists in these marginalized zones, which are always viewed as the enemy because they're the ones that are recruited for the militias, so providing the kind of economic development assistant, uh, support to prevent <coughs> uh, recruitment, these kinds of strategies. Support for institution building, specifically of the civil society organizations themselves, the political opposition, communications, logistics, organizational development, all these kind of specific nuts and bolts. Support and preparation for future governance, trainings, other kinds of things that are that and, 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 and uh, bringing people together to talk about, well, what, what, what does governing, governance mean in this particular sector, in this particular, regarding this particular issue? And this one, support for center periphery dialogue. Problem we have in the opposition civil society, of course, is you have all these people in, in, in the center scared to death of the periphery. The revolution of the, of the marginalized, as Brian used to talk, call about, talk about it. And, and, you know, here they come. So, you know, there, there's this big gulf. Increasing that uh, uh, dialogue will increase the recognition of shared objectives and facilitate, hopefully, uh, uh, more uh, uh, direct uh, uh, coordination and cooperation. You can do that through linking through the youth, particularly through youth, youth uh, student. There was somebody's pumping their fist. That's what I'm talking about. Then you have uh, 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 unions. You have party, political parties, all these different elements, faith-based groups, whatever the extent they want to be part of this. But you, you know, you, utilizing these elements to, to, to bring people together. Now, how you do that, of course, is through uh, uh, dem using democracy and governance uh, money. Uh, I think we have to have a full court press for a, 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 a reinvention of our aid policy in Sudan and, and, and a full court press for resources because what we're going to see, that pie is going to shrink. There's no doubt about it. Uh, everywhere around the world and in our own country, that's going to uh, shrink. So we've got to fight for, for resources that can make a difference. Bottom line, Sudanese are going to bring the change in Sudan. So we need to focus in on, a mo on the most effective change agents and provide the kind of catalytic uh, support and assistance that can make their efforts uh, ultimately successful. Thank you. Thank you, John. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you've already started to cover some of the moving, the looking forward pieces. Uh, so keep those thoughts in mind as you're preparing questions. I want to look back uh, just a little bit to bring, it, bring us forward. Both of you uh, worked on Sudan policy for a long time, both inside administrations and outside as policy analysts, as advocates. Uh, from your experience, what gets in the way of administrations making and executing good policy on Sudan? Who's first? You. My elder. Um, Just a couple thoughts. You, you, yeah, you could I write a book on that subject, I know. But. I think the, the, the biggest difficulty for Sudan is it doesn't get the attention at the level. There's an inertia. There's um, a caution. There's a passivity. And that has to be fought. But the bureaucracy, um, perhaps appropriately, is designed and functions to avoid risk and the political personalities who uh, drive priorities have many, many, many legitimate claimants, and Sudan usually is a weak claimant. I'll add two quick ones, fear, fear of the unknown, and, and like 
if there is change, what would that change look like? The idea that things would, could be worse is something you hear articulated, I have heard articulated literally since the 80s. Well, what, what, what is next? Uh, as if the current situation could possibly be any worse, honestly. And uh, the antidote, since we don't know, the antidote to that is knowing, is engaging and, and having a better intelligence gathering and, 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 and diplomatic representation. And so it's not such an unknown element like it was in Libya and other places where rapid change has created, has unleashed forces that we don't understand at all because we're not prepared, because we're not there. <clears throat> the second uh, element that I would add to riches is, is this counterterrorism dimension uh, where over the years, literally since, I guess since uh, the late 90s, well, the second term of Clinton, you know, we started playing footsie with these guys, then, um, uh, you know, there's this belief that the, the information that we can gather from them uh, uh, is, is uh, more important at the end of the day, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say this, but that's how it ends up coming out of the wash, the washing machine, is that the information that we can gather, even if it's tidbits, is uh, more important than a harder advocacy on the, on the human rights uh, mm -hmm. uh, side of things. Can I, can I just comment on the intelligence? <clears throat> the difficulty is that if your job is to gather intelligence, you are going to protect any sources. Yeah. And if you define your priorities with counterterrorists being a determinative consideration, those responsible for collecting intelligence have um, more leverage. And even if they're not getting much, they'd rather have some than none. With a fairly um, being familiar with a uh, significant quantity of what was learned for cooperation with Salah Ghosh, it wasn't worth the spit on your shoes. So let me just ask the follow-up on this question of uh, terrorism. Even if it were once true that uh, the U.S. policy was not tougher in Khartoum because their cooperation on international terrorism trumped our uh, concern for human rights abuses. Do you think it's true today? Today, it actually should be able to be used to the advantage of southern Sudan and um, the marginalized people. Because there's no question that the NCP um, has comfortable relationships with the Muslim Brotherhood and other um, fundamentalist groups. The phenomena of the last four years that began in Yemen and went across from Somalia to uh, Sudan, to southern Libya, to Mali, um, the NCP is not unsympathetic for. And if they weren't in desperate conditions because of the stresses they have economically and within the regime, they would be helping those elements more move to uh, deeper entrenchment in sub-Saharan Africa. So in fact, it should be an advantage for those who want to make progress in Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been one of the significant shifts since the Arab awakening over the last two uh, plus years. One footnote only, um, it's a different point, um, which is that, 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 that really, I think um, the CT stuff has been supplanted or uh, one could argue that on parallel, running on parallel tracks, but the desire to forge a deal and, 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 and uh, between the North and the South, between Sudan and South Sudan now, uh, has, has been part of the answer to this equation for, to, the, to, your quest, to your original question, Eric, uh, for, for decades now. And I remember very clearly in, our, in the Clinton years and then during uh, the early years with, with uh, Danforth, uh, this belief, real sort of, by, by most of the people involved, that the real w conflict in Sudan was between the North and the South, and once you address that, everything else would sort of fall in place. And bizarrely, this still animates a lot of the thinking. And, and I think that the, uh, the desire to try to get these 
deals that Mbeki keeps getting signed, implemented, trumps any additional uh, pressure for uh, a more uh, robust policy, say, towards the New Mountains or Blue Nile or what's happening in Darfur itself. Uh, and, and I think that um, the, the, the belief also, carcinogenic belief, but systemic, that uh, impartiality and balance doesn't, yeah, somewhere in that mix of, of uh, nouns is what the U.S. needs, where the U.S. needs to be in order to facilitate those implementation of those north-south deals. If we push too hard, they might, the Khartoum might back out of the things that we have on paper already and we'll be even further away from where we want to be. So that north-south desire to, 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 to end that conflict is what I think obstructs and undermines more now than CT or any of the other things. Uh, and it just keeps us in this spin cycle of the same very unimaginative approaches, which is basically just support and Becky and you know, encourage people to sign things and implement things without any kind of new variables being introduced in the mix, without new uh, 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 facts on the ground. And absent those, and absent any new variables internationally, why should Khartoum change? They're benefiting from the status quo. Let me take you back to the beginning of the Obama administration, which for Sudan activists seemed like a, a hopeful time. There was an announcement of a new Sudan policy promised to measure real progress on the ground. It sounded like a really good element to focus on. And had what seemed like a thoughtful understanding of offering carrots and sticks, depending on progress or lack of progress. And then we proceeded to hear a lot about the carrots. Whatever happened to the sticks? You, you talking about, the, the, uh, by, by the way, what you just described, you just described uh, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. So which one were you talking about? I, I only wanted us to go back to 2009, <laughs> so we don't have to do deep history, but I don't it seemed think very promising that day. Yeah. You even wrote complimentary things. I was thinking complimentary things. We were, we were trying only, to encourage them. If though. only. We didn't, we didn't what believe. happened? What happened? Um, yeah, it's just, um, it, we had Secretary of State attention standing at microphones with Susan Rice, and somebody had their hand up the back of Scott Gratian as a policy puppet so he'd say the right words. What happened? Well, I, I, I don't think anybody, unfortunately, anybody had their hand up Grayson's back. I think he had his own ideas, and his idea was very clearly, just like everyone who f first begins to work on Sudan, they think that, in fact, well, first of all, they're there now, so, of course, <laughs> things will be different now. And secondly, uh, uh, that the that incentives, that if we offer real carrots, because the first thing you do when you get there is those guys say, not, you never implement any of the things you say. And, we're like, and then, of course, they'll say, well, if you get a deal with me, we're going to implement them. And so uh, it just has this reinforcing logic that, that, uh, that, uh, that every new, pretty much every new, except this guy, because he had that long history, uh, 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 diplomat who gets involved, uh, who comes back with the same kind of thing. And, it, and we lose six to 12 months, sometimes even longer, when people's egomaniacal diplomats just dig in, as we saw with Gratian, and was convinced that he was right. And you know, when the presidential on, but when, when the system is built, and this is the system Obama's constructed, where only a few people are in the room when they're talking about policy, and it's only every once in a while, it's your point about very rare sort of, uh, the light comes on for a minute and there's discussion and then it goes off. And um, so, and, it, and people in the room there, uh, maybe a couple of them don't really follow it, i.e. National Security Advisor, and then, and then the Deputy National Security Advisor, self-described best friend of uh, Scott Gratian, and Gratian is the President's envoy saying, I'm sure this is the right way to go. And the President will sort of say, okay, take, take a few more months. I mean, he had to literally interject himself this is not the way a bureaucracy uh, is supposed to run. He had to interject himself, reining back Gratian at one point and, and altering the, the policy in advance of the referendum because Gratian was saying the referendum can occur on time and we should just delay it. We should support the NCP to delay, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so it was just so damaged and beyond. So I think people, individuals, can have a tremendous impact in a, in a bureaucracy when 
there isn't enough attention being paid by, by and, nor enough courage by, uh, to, to uh, implement the convictions that are signed in letters and speeches and other kinds of things that, we, that Rich has already referenced uh, in advance. Well, there are all, this, all these speeches you could re replicate from one administration to the next that have all said the same thing and none of them have done it, not much about the, 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 the stick side of the equation. Sorry. You've got no, no, just a couple. Quick observations, I think Khartoum's a lot smarter than the United States. They have a good strategy of deny, divert, delay, and then they replay it. So they deny what's happening, prevent, um, uh, violate international humanitarian law by uh, denying access then they create elaborate negotiations schemes, which are a diversion. And then they stretch it out and it delays. And then when they play that string out, they start over again. And um, the death and the destruction and the despair continue. Uh, we have really smart diplomats in the Foreign Service. They're trained and rewarded for two things, gathering information and negotiating. Note, I didn't say get the right deal. They're rewarded for gathering information and negotiating. And so therefore, they gather information, but you have to have a relationship with the government to gather information, you need sources. And you have to have somebody to talk to to negotiate, so you better not offend it. And so we have really smart people trained to do two things who can do those two things. That is not sufficient in a world where violence we find intolerable is violence that's normal. In a world where we say, how could a government treat their people that way when the government's attitude is, they're not my people. And they are willing to deny, divert, and delay. And any administration that is going to replay this minuet will just see the body count rise, the displaced rise, the suffering continue. And that is the basic distinction or the decision a president has to make. And if he makes a decision, he or she makes a decision that's unacceptable, then however good, you don't get a former foreign service officer. You get a political personality who knows the system well enough to engage it, but won't be a captive to it, and has access to leverage and put the system in a place it is most uncomfortable in being. So. Uh let me home in on the personal impact element, John, that you were just picking up uh, as you were talking about Scott Gratian. Because uh, those of us who've been working on Sudan thought the dream team for Sudan had come into office with all the right personalities, statements, attitudes, and attention when the new administration came in. It's like you couldn't have designed it better. Uh, so Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, Gail Smith, Samantha Power, ooh, all there right at the heart. And we all who don't go to the White House too often wonder how it could have gone so wrong with all of them there, pushy, powerful, knowledgeable people who had articulated what needed to happen. If it were just one, you might think the bureaucracy could overwhelm one voice. But this was all of them, including the top executives, and he brought them in as advisors. What, 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 do you have any thoughts about what accounts for how we didn't get what uh, we hope to get even close for Sudan policy? It's just, unfortunately, it's the structure, the, the system. I'm, I'm just going to repeat in 20 seconds what I said, which. Mm -hmm. This is what Obama, this is the, the National Security Council that Obama created. It's very heavily reliant on his National Security Advisor. 
who, for, Sudan, for whom Sudan is not a priority, uh, kicked down to the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, uh, and who was very strongly supportive in blanket terms of what the President's envoy and the President coming into office was like, I've chosen my envoy, now that envoy's going to go out. Everybody said, and it's certainly from his own reading of Gratian's record and his own interactions with him on the campaign trail, he thought he was a very competent character, and go do your work. Yeah. I got other things going on, like the meltdown of the international financial infrastructure. So um, I think you know that's basically what happened, and, and you have other people operating in the system, fighting in that system. I cannot tell you how uh, bloodily, but at the end of the day, the structure is the way it was mm -hmm. created, and I don't know if he's going to change that structure for the second term. But you know, and every president has been different in terms of how the relationship between that president and the State Department and, that, and, that, and the Secretary of State and that president and the and National Security Advisor, and this guy heavily leans on his National Security Advisor. But I think he's, this is the, the opportunity. I'm not going to, in fact, I'm not going to indulge any more of these negative questions. The, the thing is going to change because <laughs> it, it's going to the state. Yeah. Uh, it, with McDonough's uh, moving over to Ch Chief of Staff and Kerry coming in saying, these are my things. I'm not going to be, you know, some second fiddle to, to some bureaucrat who doesn't have any face to, to, to uh, you know, so we're going to have a, a State Department that's in charge of Sudan policy now, which could be good and could not be good. we got to see who the people are, because you can get those the worst tendencies that all the things Rich has uh, talked about reinforced. But, yeah, you know, so there's an opportunity here to, to open the thing up a little bit, and, uh, and I, and I, it, but you, you have, when, in any book in political science, and, and for those that's studied or are students here now, you know, it's a, the, the implementation processes and structures are often way more important than all the rhetoric and the speeches and the intentions and all the rest of that. And that structure for this was death for any kind of imagination on Sudan for the last four years. Rich, do you want to add anything to that? So let me ask a, a quick follow-up. So key position, National Security Advisor. Yeah, he's been there for a while. How about if Susan Rice takes his job? Write him a letter. Okay. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. All right, let me look, uh, uh, start looking forward, and uh, I'll ask the first question. There are people lined up. I think that no one else has to get up because there are enough questions uh, already lined up. So here's the first one, looking forward. Uh, for years, the U.S. has been condemning the government of Sudan for grave human rights abuses. Often we use the code language, strongest possible terms. We use the grave word, another code word. And Bashir seems to have learned that he can safely ignore us when we condemn him. Uh, and when the UN demands, but without incurring consequences, are there a couple specific things that the US can do to change that calculus in Khartoum that they can ignore the world from that? Sure. The US has a big toolbox. Are some of those tools um, Robust? Yes. Has uh, the Khartoum regime uh, intransigence and continued tolerance and engagement in atrocities warranted more robust action? Sure. That's not the question. The question is, ultimately, is the President of the United States willing to use those? It's not, I mean, it's simple. And I can say this because it's all publicly leaked. In, in, uh, four months uh, toward the end of the uh, Bush administration, I gave him options to move uh, ships outside of the port of Sudan, which was not, uh, I didn't propose a blockade, but it was a way to tell Khartoum, look, if we want to do that, we can do it. And then second was to jam all communications, which could be done by noon on Monday, um, if you want to. And third was just take out a helicopter. Just one. Just one. And you have a choice. You can push a button and it gets done. You can send in some seals. Push a button, it's pretty obvious it's us. If you do seals, it's obvious it's us, but we can deny it. <laughs> but. But the, the, the point just being to, to tell Khartoum, oh my gosh, 
they really do care. But these are not stupid people. They've been, they've survived in a really, 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 really tough neighborhood for a really, really long time. They are smart, they are tough, and they've taken the measure of the man, and the result is more people die. The um, opportunities emerge all the time uh, uh, in, in international relations. You, you take, for example, when uh, Luis Moreno Ocampo uh, uh, issued his arrest warrant for uh, President Bashir. Um, and the, uh, the moment that that represented, the, the, the potential point of diplomatic leverage that could have been utilized uh, uh, at the time uh, by uh, the U.S. and other supporters of the ICC and how that over time uh, was squandered by the United States and other ICC supporters, never using the leverage that that sort of Damocles uh, held, uh, uh, frittering it away. Uh, the post-referendum, uh, uh, another opportunity, post-referendum um, uh, China policy, you know, the immediate aftermath of the creation of a new state altered forever China's economic calculations. What do we do about it? Every once in a while, maybe Princeton would have a day or two in Beijing. I mean, again, Princeton, great guys. All of his diplomat as you're going to get out of the Foreign Service, a fantastic human being. But uh, this is not uh, taking advantage of an incredible moment, a uh, window of opportunity uh, of China's potential reorientation. And now, of course, there's business as usual. Um, so one app, we could go on all day about the various opportunities, and there'll be new ones that we can't even know now. And are we going to be prepared and ready to act on those? So yes, you can alter the equation by taking advantage of those moments and, and moving. Something that seems impossible today could very well be possible tomorrow in that moment, that using a window of opportunity and pushing through it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with questions from the, uh, the floor. I remind you, Please ask a question and, and limit it to one minute. And the first one is Luis Moreno Ocampo. Um, what's a great panel, thank you. Uh, it's not Scott Gray's responsibility. It's not Security Council's responsibility. It's President Obama's responsibility. He knew, he still knew, he knew what he was doing. Can he change? That's a question because Richard can advise him how to use the Arras Warren to create leverage. Because he, w when I issued the Arras Warren, France and UK were the gains, and China was the gains. He put them together, but he needed Bush behind him. And then he did it, and get the momentum. And when you talk, I agree with you, the Sudanese had to lead. And I like your comment, they had to engage the NCP. But then they can say, guys, as soon as you are not indicted, you are part of the future. If you're indicted, you are not. So they can, they can put back ICC as a democracy sword against the new guys and against the old guys. And because you can, you can just threaten them. I threat Bashir to arrest him in the air, in the air and he was, he's flying with the half of the Air Force because they are afraid of that. So you don't need, either, either, you don't need to implement SEAL operation. You just tell them we're planning. We're planning, our field guys are planning. And both of you are the perfect guys. So to answer, my question is, first question, is President Obama- This is the first time anyone has ever forced Luis Moreno Ocampo to ask a question. Uh, this is it, history. Ask any other, I Quick, cross Quickly, again. sir, we, Thank have, you. we Thank have, you. have a short uh, amount of time. The first question is, is President Obama worried about his legacy? He started with the genocide, would end with the genocide ongoing? Second, had he received Richard Williamson and your advice, how to do it? Thank you. What can you say? Um, I, I, I've had, um, I guess, what, six, six or seven meetings now with President Obama since he started as president. We had a good history in, when he was a senator, and, 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 and we've continued that. And the, the remarkable thing is how, how knowledgeable 
he is about the details of what's going on there. So your point is right on, spot on in terms of the, 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 at the end of the day, it's his that he has to own. And I now, I now sit with all of you in sort of as, as, as observers in a much bigger uh, uh, play uh, whether, this guy, whether this president will, in his second term, be much more, much less inhibited by some of the, the calculations and the personnel that uh, limited the imagination uh, in the first term. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but certainly everyone in this room, including us up here, are putting forward through multiple channels the ideas that are being expressed by many of us, that by many of the people over the last two days, and uh, will continue to do so. And I know, and this is a very, I hope, I'll make this point now, and I hope it's relevant to exactly what you're asking, but it, I didn't want it to, to leave without making this point because it's the only important thing that I would want to communicate to you. And that is that in those meetings, it was abundantly clear that he perceived there to be a Sudan-related constituency that involved uh, students, involved faith-based groups, involved human rights activists, involved celebrities, I mean, clearly, Half, two of those, three of those meetings were with George and his, their close relationship, donor, you know, all this stuff. And so he, he perceives this as a reason why, as a political reason why he needs to do more. So that, this is a major advantage that we have, is that, uh, that, that, that he does not see doing more on Sudan as a political liability, which I think many, politicians would make that calculation <clears throat> who aren't plugged into the fact that there is a constituency <coughs> throughout the United States. So I think that that gives us a, a, an advantage <coughs> going forward. We just have to unify around a, a few particular points that we want to press and push and demand to make that policy change. But I don't, I don't know if he's going to be the President that we all voted, or that many of us, not all of us, that's for sure, voted for. Uh, sorry about that. Woo! <laughs> well, I don't know exactly who you voted for, anyways. So. Yeah. Did you really vote for him? No, I'm kidding. But uh, uh, <laughs> my favorite Republican. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, uh, and by the way, we did submit a memo proposing him as a special envoy yeah. for Sudan for this administration. Yeah. So, I mean, I could, we got to have the right people in place. Look, it's, it's not really my place to, um, to try to guess what President Obama's priorities are. But I'll say two things. I do think he was very consistent in 08 and 012 that he is deeply committed to his vision of social justice and a domestic agenda. I think that's where he sees his legacy. He points to, um, from his perspective, the great achievement on health care. I think his push on um, early daycare um, coverage uh, is consistent with that vision. I think that's where he sees his legacy. Therefore, on foreign policy, uh, it's harder to get space. And the space he does get is usually responding to crisis. So it's, uh, it's not a situation I can help. But the, many of the people in this room, John and others, who are part of that tribe saying this is important, I think uh, can be effective because I sincerely believe it would not take that much to alter the dynamic, get things moving, and then you'd have an opportunity for daylight and progress. It wouldn't take that much. You just have to get some attention from the president and him empowering Special Envoy, Secretary of State, whoever it might be, to uh, advance it. And that's really, um, the opportunity and responsibility of the people in this room will believe that we should stop the suffering in Sudan. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of people standing up, and uh, we, we'll be lucky if we got three questions in, so I'm just warning you're welcome to stand, but only the people near the front of the line will have a chance. Next question over here, please. Uh, one minute question. Please be brief. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pendergast and Mr. Williams, 
you have made a day of a veteran rebel. Now the key words is remove change. As uh, Dr. Jones said, one de some decades ago that this regime is too deformed to be removed, to be reformed. So it has to be to be removed. Now my question relates to two things. One, uh, we are two kinds of people who are resisting the regime in Khartoum. Some of uh, are your citizens, American citizens, who are of Sudanese origin. And I think this is what, if the policy change towards the direction you say, this is fulfilling a duty towards citizens. For us, who are not American citizens, we think this is an obligation on the American people. It's not a charity that they change the position. So, so would, there be, like would there the be a legal, legal framework for this, like Sudan Peace Act and all those things in the old days? One, the second question, which is very short, is that, you know, there was, I got a feeling, a very bad feeling some, throughout the years, that America was outsourcing moral leadership when it's doing the things. So the question's got to come right now. The, sec the, second question, the second question is, in the rebels like us in, in, in the field, we want the envoy to speak in the language we understand. For example, just to give a small example, okay. when, you, when you say cookies, we're, we're, we don't know we're, what we're, we're, we're going to have to. Thank you. Thank you. So, since time is so short, let me take, if people promise to ask really quick questions, like you got 45 seconds, we'll take two more questions and then they'll try to address the several thoughts. So from this side, Slater. Um, I would just like to ask, I, I, I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that President Obama's career was launched on the Darfur uh, movement and I, the contrast with the last administration is the amount of speaking that we've heard. And I feel that President Obama lost his voice uh, for Darfur when he got the bully pulpit. And I want to know, when will our community give him the same pressure that we gave the former administration? Uh, thank you. And same rules. If, do your question in 45 seconds. Um, uh, the president who I voted for gave a $3 billion financial bailout, which has undermined 15 years of sanctions with the North-South Agreement in September. What's the status of that money? Can it be taken back? And when I went to the White House through some oversight, I was shocked that McDonough and Grant Harris had no understanding of Sudan or the NCP. Which one of you two guys is going to educate those two people about Sudan? Thank you. What, okay, so uh, let, let's try two more quick ones. 45 seconds. Go. Um, my question is, what would you recommend to the opposition to garner uh, greater international support so they'd um, put together a platform, they're unifying, but what else can they do to garner international support? Thank you for being a model of concision. Uh -huh. 45 seconds, and this is the last one. Okay, well, I have a question for John Prendergast. Uh, for years, and before Obama comes to the office, we have uh, you actually very strong on uh, humanitarian or actually genocide. Now, uh, your uh, four points, it is just like a recipe for the uh, failed policies of Obama in the four years. So why you are becoming actually very weak in the <laughs> facing the problems of uh, Obama facing oh, Sudan? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, people can sit down because we won't have time to take more. So uh, this is going to be your last uh, chance to speak as we tie up the session. So think about those questions if you could touch on as many as you can, if you can be very brief. And with all of these activists in the room, uh, maybe throw in a thought at the end about uh, some message you want to give to us as activists who want to work for a just and lasting peace for Sudan. So um, who would like to go first? James, John. Okay. 
So uh, quick, four or five quick points. There, there will be a bill uh, uh, in Congress very soon, you know, the preparations being made now, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, so at least, if I understood you correctly, sort of a legal framework, a legislative framework, that would be the, the one, and it will be an enhancement of the, the, the thing that came out last year. Um, I think that, uh, that um, uh, President uh, Obama did feel the uh, sting of the uh, constituency uh, backlash uh, in 2009, 2010. I always get these years and chronologies mixed up, but when, the, when there was a sort of a, a escalated campaign uh, holding his feet to the fire about promises and all that kind of stuff, ads and all the rest of it. Uh, he took it very personally, and I think part of the response, the, the uh, uh, focus on the referendum and the, and the, and the, uh, the uh, downplay or the uh, removal of Gratian uh, from the scene over time was as a result of the constituency pressures. So demonstrating that, in fact, when we do uh, uh, push hard, uh, and, 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 and hit hard, there is a response. Um, the opposition, uh, I think, uh, Sudanese opposition, you know, I, I, I feel that the New Dawn Charter uh, was an extremely important step forward um, and that further dialogue and further engagement and further coalition building with uh, opposition groups and civil society groups uh, in the context of that uh, New Dawn Charter is, is uh, something that uh, if we can amplify it here in the U.S. and other around the world, if we can amplify the importance of that and demand that there be some kind of response from the U.S. government and others in support of that, because that's what the U.S. diplomats have been asking for for, for literally many, many years. Uh, is some kind of uh, symbol of opposition coalescence around a future uh, 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 disposition of, of government. I think that, that that would be something that I think would be very well received, is that further deepening of opposition coalescence. Um, <clears throat> why am I becoming weak? <laughs> Good question. I don't, I didn't see it that way. I think it's just, we're, we're I'm just trying to see the, uh, see the, uh, the, import, the, the importance of language. And if, you want to, if we want to be taken seriously and listened and, and our voices heard, I think we just have to be selective in the kind of terminology that we use. We can mean precise, we can, we can uh, continue to mean what we mean, but how we say it should be, uh, I think, uh, addressed in ways that make sense to, to uh, the, the systems that we're trying to influence and are consistent with what the Sudanese are pushing and pressing for. So I, I see these kinds of, of uh, uh, sort of linguistic maneuvers solely as a vehicle to figure out how we can be much more robust in our support for a change agenda. And then finally, the, the sort of point to the, to the group uh, uh, is, uh, is a reinforcement of this point about the, the, the critical uh, uh, importance of the constituency in policy development. Um, I think that more than any other, perhaps tied with the invisible children and the LRA issue, the, these two, Sudan and the LRA, this is my discussions with Secretary Clinton, discussions with President Obama, with, in, with now new Secretary uh, Kerry, their sensitivity towards this constituency, these constituencies in uh, Sudan and, and, um, and the LRA issue uh, are very high, and therefore we have an influence. Our voices, we need, <clears throat> just like we're asking, and we've seen the Sudanese coming together more and more in order to demonstrate a future what a possible future could look like, we need to do the same uh, in, in, in the advocacy community and having a few uh, positions that we can jointly advocate uh, 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 over the course of the next few months, these critical months as Kerry sort of develops his, new, his policy, and he will be the dominant actor, I think, in the second term on Sudan. 
Uh, so we should, be, we should be thinking about how to influence that, the new secretary and, and on what two or three things that we want to see real change to occur in U.S. policy. And we will, we will be able to make a difference in that regard. Th thank you, John. Uh, Rich, uh, some brief additional thoughts. Uh, four quick points. One, um, on the opposition, I just point out, I think uh, John, with the use of uh, various celebrities, particularly George Clooney, has been very effective at piercing the white no noise. I think with Senator Menendez and Congressman Wolf, you have two people that are knowledgeable and in positions to uh, cause some trouble, and you should encourage them to do it. Also on the opposition, though, I will make an uh, observation that was uh, raised yesterday. When I was ambassador of the UN Security Council, we used to joke that whenever one of our African do uh, colleagues came in on an issue, it was kind of, I'm from Africa, I have this problem, what are you going to do about it? I look around and I said, well, we got a lot of problems too. So you've got to say, look, we're part of the opposition. This is what we're going to do about it, and here's how you can help. Two, on the ICC, I find it frigging amazing. I don't support the ICC. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bush administration supported going after Omar al-Bashir more than this administration. And how many of you have said anything? I find it mind-boggling because the concept of accountability from Nuremberg and the Tokyo trials to the ICTY to the ICTR to the Sierra Leone court are American-driven. And the concept of accountability has been American-driven and the rule of law. And I remember the meeting in the White House in the Oval Office listening to some other views and just saying to the President, I said, look, Mr. President, there's a question. You're the first guy who called this fellow genocideer. Is this issue about accountability for his genocideer? Or is it a, a theological discussion of the ICC? And he said, damn it. I'm going to stand up against this guy. And he went out and said something. These guys tanked. I think it's caused, it's eroded accountability. It's eroded the rule of law. It's eroded the ICC. And everybody in this room, except for me, supports the ICC. And you're all complicit. Three. <laughs> okay. <sorry. laughs> This, this is why I'm not diplomatic. <laughs> There's good news and bad news. The good news is President Barack Obama is a good and decent man. Good news is he genuinely wants to do the right thing. Good news is when confronted with an issue in Sudan, his instincts are correct. The bad news is, like every president, he's crowded out and he doesn't care enough to drive it. So you have to force that, either by who's the special envoy or how John Kerry can get a claim of diplomatic stardom or something. Because unless you do that, the asset of having a good and decent man who shares your views in the Oval Office will be above the battle and beside the point. Fourth. A president's first job is national security. This is not complicated. It is national security. And his second job is vital interests, usually important economic ones. Well, now you have a security interest <clears throat> against a Khartoum uh, regime that wants to be a fellow traveler with the Muslim Brotherhood and allow extremism to spread sub-Saharan Africa. But after national security and vital interest, your values should animate your foreign policy. That's what's distinguished America. That's what Barack Obama referred to in justifying what happened in Libya. That's why he should engage. That It is his responsibility. It is his opportunity. Don't let him off the hook. 